Good day ladies and gents, welcome to this worked example. Today we're going to be calculating the, um, well doing the calculations for the design of a pinned base plate, a base plate only carrying axle and shear loads but not moments. Uh, so here's our example, we have a steel column, a 406-178-54. In the next example we will actually add on a fixed base plate and design it for that. But for now we've just got that column and it's got this base plate as shown here. So we've got two holding down bolts uh, in the middle so it will struggle to develop any sort of fixed capacity. But irrespective it's only carrying a mo I mean an axial load. So there's only an axial load coming down it so we will only design for the axial load and um, it's fixed to a base plate and we now need to determine what is this thickness and then also what is our um, holding down bolt size that we need to deal with. So to read through the question, consider the base plate shown below. Determine a base plate thickness and bolt size for the load combinations of, and we've got two load combinations, LC1, load combination 1, with a compressive force of 800 kilonewtons and a shear force of 90, and then a second load combination 2, TU, that's, so there's an upward tension force of 100 kilonewtons, and VU, a shear force of 25 kilonewtons. All steel workers grade um, 355JR and commercial grade holding down bolts are used. Assume that concrete pullout failure has been prevented by rebar, so we're not going to worry about the, how long the um, holding down bolt is embedded into the concrete and is the anchor plate big enough. The concrete strength is 25 MPa. So with looking at that, as per some of the previous derivations, when we look at this section, we ignore the holding down bolts when they are in compression, so then we just pretend they don't even exist. But in tension, so in compression, holding down bolts take no load. In tension, they take basically all the load. So coming back to our equations, what we will find then, just looking at those load combinations, that tension force there... Um, is going to govern the size, more likely than not. It's slightly possible if shear was governing that that might come into play, but generally the tension will govern the strength. So we're going to have a look and then design for the combined tension and shear force. That will be more severe than the one shear force on its own. And then once we have a holding down bolt size for the worst case, which is load combination 2, then we will design the base plate because the worst um, base plate condition will probably be for load combination 1 where we have the compressive load coming down and then the shear load as well. So I'm going to now start running through the calcs and uh, start um, placing everything in uh, the section here. So I've drawn out a very basic base plate layout and we're going to gradually sketch onto it. So firstly let's state our assumptions of why or how we're going to go about doing this problem. So due to um, shear tension interaction um, we will find that the load combination 2 governs. Um, but also because of the shear tension interaction, um, we cannot determine the bolt size directly. Bolt size cannot be determined directly. Directly, but directly. Come on. However, load combination 2 governs and will be dealt with first. Uh, governs, just to make it clear, governs 4 HD bolt size. So, for load combination 2, we're now going to start running through the, the calcs. As I said, because we can't determine the exact size, because there is this sheer um, tension resistance requirement. So we're first going to just try a bolt size. Try a 20 mil diameter HD bolt, commercial quality steel, commercial quality steel. You could otherwise, if in doubt, you could just take the tension force and get to an approximate um, size that you need for only tension and then just upscale to the nearest size. That would give you a good first estimate, if in doubt, if you should know where to go for 20 or 16 or a 24 mil bolt. So we've got a 20 mil diameter HD bolt 
Um, our tension resistance is, according to this equation, based on the South African Institute of Steel Construction Green Book or the Red Book, which is all the same then for this specific one as the uh, SANS 10162, our design code. And we're going to multiply by the number of bolts where the area of the bolt is 0.75 pi d squared over 4. And if we plug in the values there, we will end up with this. I, I'm not going to show all the working just to prevent this from being very long, but you should run through and write all your steps with all your working. Now, once we've got an area, therefore our tension resistance is 0.67. That's our partial factor in tension for holding on bolts. 235.6 times 365 times, and then there's two bolts. And just to convert newtons into kilonewtons, I multiply it by 10 to the 3 kilonewtons. So that's our resistance, and that is greater than our force. So that's a good sign. Now we know we've got a bit of extra capacity, so we can use that for the shear resistance. But now we need to continue on with the shear resistance. And there are two different failure modes we need to now start looking at. First one where is just the bolt contribution. Where we just shear straight through the bolt. Um, it's a circular failure mechanism of the bolt. So to go back here, that would be as if we just fail it straight through that blue area I've just highlighted there. Um, and that is, um, and there's obviously two of them. So that gives us a VR, a shear resistance value of the two bolts. And this is the equation to calculate the resistance with the holding down bolts, the ultimate strength, and we multiply that by n. I'm just going to plug in all the numbers just so you can see. The reason I'm doing that for this one specifically is that there is a... Um, uh, the 0.7 factor in front accounts for the fact that it's not the full area of the bolts we are dealing with. Um, squared over 4 times by 365 and we multiply that by 2 and that's 77.1 kilonewtons. Now we also have the bearing resistance so what will happen in the calculations is that when there is a shear force applied to this section and the bolts have to carry shear force the upper area of the bolt bears against the concrete and that green area there could fail. And this we approximate as about five diameters. So the area in bearing you'll see is five diameters times the width, which is another which is D. So the area is five D squared when we look at the calculation for bearing resistance. So coming back to our equations, now we've got bearing resistance. And with that, we end up with BR is 1.12 um, phi C. So this is now concrete failing, so we have the concrete partial factor, A star. And once again, using concrete strengths here, where A star equals 5 times the diameter squared. That was that area I highlighted now. And uh, running through these calcs, you end up with the following. So the 10 to the negative 3 to convert it into kilonewtons. So that is 67.2 kilonewtons. So, Therefore, the shear resistance of the bolts is greater than, I mean, 
is equal to 67.2. This is the bearing resistance. The bearing resistance will govern. Um, and this is greater than the ultimate strength, therefore OK. So this is good for load combination too. We have more than enough capacity. However, we also now need to check when there is both shear and tension in these bolts. So combine shear and tension. And what we end up at this stage is the following equation, uh, which accounts for the interaction of the um, forces and the resistance of the forces, and make sure that this is still sufficient. So this must be less than or equal to 1. Just as a, something to think about, our shear resistance there that is, this equation is specifically looking at bolt failure and when the bolt steel itself is overstressed. But now the equation above we looked at is a concrete failure, so it is a different area failing. So it doesn't, when the concrete fails, it doesn't contribute to the um, bolts um, failing in a combined shear and tension. Because we need to find out what is the shear force. I mean, in that, and then also at the same time, what is the tension force? And then acting on the same area at the same time. This, this green area is a separate failure mechanism. So I'm, I'm going to ignore that in these equations. So when I pick the shear resistance now, I'm picking the ones in the steel because this is com, um, calculating the resistance based upon the steel failing. So now coming back, this, this is for load combination 2. And I run through the calcs. As I said now, that value is from the shear resistance about there. So this must be less than or equal to 1, which equals to 0.943, therefore less than 1, therefore the diameter 20 commercial quality bolt is OK. That is sufficient. Now we need to check the base plate thickness. And as I said last time, we will check that um, for load combination 1 and how that's going to influence it. So with a compressive load coming down the column, I'm going to go down to my um, go back to my diagram here and just delete off some of the uh, items I've previously drawn. We've got our two bolts here. When the load comes down, as we've done in the previous derivation looking at the capacity of um, pinned columns, we assume that the load spreads out a distance c. But based upon the diagram we can see the load doesn't have to spread very far on the top and the side and it will basically fall off the edge of the base plate. Because if I trace a pattern, a distance all the way around C from the column, what you quickly see is chances are it's going to fall off the sides and the ends. We don't know, and it would depend on the, the magnitude of the load. And But we're going to assume for now that it's this area here, the red hatched area, which is carrying the load. It is possible that you don't know exactly when you start out and you'd have to assume one, run through the calcs and then see does your final solution match what um, you did assume and if it does that's fine, if not then you would have to update. And as I mentioned this distance between the edge of the steel and the edge of the compression zone is C and this is on all sides. It's that same distance C, it spreads out all around. And we need to solve for C, then once we've got that value, that compressive zone distance C, then we can solve for the base plate thickness. So going back, now I'm going to continue on with load combination 1. For load combination 1, we're going to assume that C is greater than A. The A being the edge distance, I showed it on our diagram that there's A1 and A2, but so we're assuming that the 
um, compression zone is greater than the edge zone. Therefore, from sum of forces in the y equals 0, we end up with the compressive force coming down. equaling, so this is our effective area on the left, um, and this is going to equal our hatched area on the right. So I'm breaking this up into a few different zones, A plus TF plus C plus TW. So what I have here is some um, diagrams showing the behavior. So I'm just going to modify that. That is, I'm going to call A. I don't actually need A2 um, just yet, but I've got two areas. I'm just going to, for instance, call them 1, 1 and 2. And that was all I did. I've the effective area, the hatched red area, is area 1, and there's two of them, plus area 2, and that gives me these equations that I've just worked out. Um, you can run through those to quickly see how they all come, but it's just the area of two rectangles that we've worked with. Um, now we substitute in values. And get into the form. So we can solve this because we want to find the value of c, that it is a squared term that we're looking for in terms of c. And um, if you plug in those values, you will find out that alpha is minus 4, beta is 1146.4. And we've got our gamma value here as well. And then C is the solution to this. The following equation. And if we plug all of that in, we will end up with... or 41.4 and often you have to do this by inspection because both of these answers are mathematical solutions and in theory could hold but physically speaking a value of 245 is not actually physically possible on our base plate so you would have a look and say yes then c equals 41.4 millimeters that's the distance the load is spreading out on all sides and C is greater than our A distance, so assumption correct. We would need to redo the section above if our assumption was not correct. Now once I've got that, I can start going through to calculate the um, thickness of the base plate. And the equation that I'm going to use now we have derived previously in a separate video, but the thickness of the base plate will be greater than or equal to 2 times by sigma over and then C outside the brackets. And um, just remember that stress under the base plate is always 0.6 times our um, concrete strength. We use sixty five per cent of the concrete strength. And from this we end up with that our base plate needs to be at least twelve point seven millimeters thick. And then therefore use a fourteen millimeter, the next available size up base plate and that will give us the su uh, sufficient capacity. Um, so you can see the South African inst uh, 
South African Steel Construction Handbook or the Red Book, Table 223 for details on standard thicknesses. And also we have a rule of thumb that the thickness of the base plate should be not be less than the flange. But here the thickness of the base plate is greater than the thickness of the flange, so that's okay. Um, it's not a structural requirement, it's more just a practicality. So 14 more sufficient. But now still we have to consider the shear forces in the base plate because the second um, load combination that we're dealing with, LC1, the shear force is actually higher. If the shear force was lower, we could have actually stopped our design right now because we've already checked the shear capacity previously. But now what we need to do is make sure that for load combination 1, our shear capacity is still satisfied. So I'm going to continue down to the um, on to just check and finalize our shear resistance. Shear resistance, the good thing now is we do also have compression coming down which means there's friction between the base plate and the column. When there's tension there is no friction because the base plate lifts up so you can't rely on um, friction when there's tension but you can rely on friction when there is a compressive load coming down. So our shear resistance due to friction is that time partial factor times the coefficient of friction times the compressive load and this must be less than 5 MPa times the gross area of the base plate. Uh, that's just an upper bound to the shear that it can carry. So our coefficient of friction between the steel and the concrete is about 0.545 times 800 kilonewtons and that equals in 270 kilonewtons. The resistance due to friction um, five times the gross area of the base plate is five. I just add the MPA just to make it clear where that five comes from because sometimes it's doesn't uh, it's not clear what five actually is. It's just a limiting stress. So this is fine. That means our um, our resistance is greater than the friction force, or well, the max, the upper bound is greater than our force, therefore that's okay. We're not worried about exceeding the shear capacity of the concrete. Therefore, our total resistance is a combination of friction plus the shear resistance of the bolts, which we've calculated previously. And remember, this is, could be any failure mechanism. This is the total resistance to the shear force, um, not looking specifically in the, inside the steel as we did on our last example, or last calculation, 337.2 kilonewtons, which is greater than VU, which is equal to 90 kilonewtons. So we have more than enough capacity in this base plate. Therefore, it's okay, the shear capacity Therefore, in summary, a 14 millimeter um, oops, base plate with 20 mole diameter commercial quality bolts is, is sufficient. And with that, we end up solving the problem and providing a base plate with sufficient capacity to the applied loads and getting to a final resistance that satisfies the load combinations. And once again, we took our base plate. We first found out the bolt size based on the tension force, and then we found out our compression force based upon the, well, the base plate thickness based on the compressor force. We have ignored one thing at the moment. Um, which we will treat now in the next worked example where we specifically look at um, bolts in tension. But we have ignored the fact that when this force is applied in down in tension, it could actually fail a section of this base plate. And so that should be checked as well. However, we will be checking that in our next example to explain what you would do with that. So thank you very much.